to you, our beloved friends, and happy Sabbath. Welcome and thank you for joining us again in our worship to God, our creator. Our foundation text for our topic this morning is found in Matthew 22, 41 and 42. I read, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of Christ, whose son is he? They said unto him, the son of David. Uh, shall we bow our heads for prayer? Dear Jesus, our God, thank you for loving us and thank you for the Sabbath day. Please give us all your presence, grace us with your presence, and please bless us all together with our friends around the world who are with us today during our worship to you. This I ask in Jesus' holy name, I pray. But before Dr. Frias give our morning worship this morning, we'll hear some songs from our seniors. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful song. Thank you. Uh, today we're going to talk about the story of Jesus. So uh, we're going to prepare this now.
All right. Our topic this morning is uh, Jesus Christ. Was he a God? Uh, we are going to review the claims of Jesus uh, based from the writings of the Bible. Okay. Now, was Jesus God? Uh, according to the text that was read earlier in Matthew, uh, Jesus asked the, the the Jesus asked the Pharisees, "What? Who do you think Jesus is?" And they said that he is the son of uh, not son of God, but uh, the son son of David or son, son of, of David. son of David. Yes. World opinion is divided about the true identity of Jesus Christ. He is easily the most controversial figure of history. To millions of Christians, he is God. Uh, he is God made manifest in human flesh. To uh, the non-Christians, he is just an ordinary, ordinary man. Perhaps the best man who ever lived, but nothing more. To millions of others, he is just a name, a legend, a vague mythical figure whose identity means nothing more than uh, uh, that of Santa Claus. So he just compared to some people, he just compared to Santa Claus. Those who worship Jesus believe that they have the best reasons for doing so. They're eager to share with others the evidence that has convinced them of his deity. The purpose of our uh, lesson today is to consider some of the chief reasons why millions of Christian people believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and why they worship him as their God. So here's a picture of Jesus Christ. Uh, I know that a lot of these pictures were just uh, imagination based on the character of Jesus Christ, it's kind, loving, and so on. But, uh, and there are people who were drawing before, so it's possible that there should be some resemblance in some of this drawing. But anyway, the claims of Jesus Christ, we cannot hope to exhaust these claims in one brief Bible lesson. We will therefore select just a few examples. He claimed eternal pre-existence and quality with God. That's found in John 17, 5. He claimed complete freedom from personal, uh, from, his, uh, be, uh, from his personal. That's found also in uh, John 8, 46. He claimed to be the only means of saving access to God. He claimed that we cannot have an access to God except through him. That's another claim of Jesus, John 14, 6. Jesus also claimed power to forgive sins against God. That's in Matthew 2, 5 to 10. Jesus claimed power to foretell the future, John 14, 29. Jesus claimed power to conquer death and to raise the dead. That's found in John 11, 25. He also claimed uh, and decide their eternal destinies in the last day. So these are the claims of Jesus. So Jesus made all those claims and we're going to study uh, today about the uh, significant or validity of those claims. As we consider these claims, there are three questions that arise. If God were to come to earth today, what higher claims could he make? How much further could he go? What shall we do with this stupendous claims of Jesus Christ? There are only three ways in which we can classify Jesus in view of his claims. So in view of his claims, we can classify uh, that he was utterly self-deceived. If it is not true, he was utterly self-deceived. Another one is that he was utterly dishonest. And the other consideration is that he is utterly truthful. This is by far the greatest dilemma, trilemma, that ever confronted the human heart. How shall we 
solve this problem. That Jesus Christ again. The credentials of Jesus Christ. By the credentials, we mean proofs of genuineness, evidences of good faith. When Ulysses, the ancient Greek hero, returned home in disguise after many years of wandering, he proved his identity in an instant by a single feat of incomparable strength. You see, Ulysses was away for a while, and uh, when he returned, maybe people do not recognize him as uh, Ulysses. He might have grown a beard, like, uh, for example, some people did not recognize me when I grew my beard, uh, or uh, his hair might be long, or whatever. So they, they wouldn't believe that he was, the, he was uh, Ulysses. So in the presence of his rivals, he bent the, uh, he bent the, uh, with his, his own great war bow because he had a war bow that he left, which uh, had lain idle during the years of his absence, in which no one was able to, to draw it, or no one was able to, uh, to bend it, because uh, Ulysses was much stronger than them. How does Jesus Christ prove his identity as God? By performing works that are uh, worthy of God's work of incomparable strength, works that are obviously beyond the wisdom and power of man. So this is how Jesus Christ has identified himself by doing things that are beyond the power of man. See, this is a picture of uh, Ulysses when he tried to prove himself as uh, uh, to be, when he tried to prove to his friend that it was he, Ulysses, who was away for a while. He lived a sinless life. This is, we're not talking about Jesus. Jesus fulfilled scores of Old Testament prophecies. That's in Luke 24, 25 to 27. Jesus made predictions of his own, many of which have already been fulfilled. Matthew 24, 2. Jesus performed many miraculous works, even raising the dead that Matthew 11, two to five. Jesus rose from the dead himself. That is uh, something like there are many religious leaders uh, the, that also claim that they rose from the dead, but no human being was able to see them. While in Jesus time when he rose from the dead, there were many witnesses. Remember the disciples? Uh, the disciples, most of them, except John, were uh, killed uh, in a very, uh, very crucial way. In a, in a, uh, they, they were, they were uh, killed, not in an easy way, but in a very hard way. Some of them were beheaded. Some of them were hung upside down, uh, placed in the, uh, boiling oil and so on. But they did not. They, because they were asked, they were uh, they were asked to confess that the resurrection of Jesus was not uh, true. Now, if it costs your life to be killed violently, uh, and and you know that you cannot, uh, and you know that uh, uh, you don't want to tell a lie, you don't want to tell a lie, uh, or if it's not true, wouldn't it be better to just? tell a lie and say, no, it's not true, so that you will be, uh, so that you will be freed and you will not be, be killed anymore. But those disciples did not. They sacrificed their lives. They were willing to die uh, just uh, in, in, instead of compromising the truth because they themselves knew that, uh, and they saw Jesus. Remember, Jesus even appeared to them uh, after he re resurrected from death. So uh, some uh, religious leaders, they claim uh, that they have, they resurrected, but no one saw them. They just say resurrected in spirit, maybe uh, uh, show them some signs or feelings or whatever, but inspiration. But, you know, there, there are two sources of inspiration. It could be inspiration from God. It could be inspiration from the devil. So, you know, who knows? But Jesus Christ himself showed himself to be able to, uh, have power over death. 
and he also has broken the clay the chains of sinful habit in countless uh, millions of lives you see you will find that when jesus uh, when people believe in jesus i have experienced this myself in my going to the philippines and other places uh, and preaching about god whenever somebody uh, accept jesus christ his life is changed for example one time we were in the philippines and after the uh, crusade after that seminar a family of, of i think about almost 10 because they had so many children uh, came to me and said uh, dr fias do you remember us i could not uh, remember very well so i just said yeah yeah how are you I, i didn't say i remember i didn't say yes or no and then the wife continued well you buy you baptized uh, you know you were here you were the cause of us all being baptized when you were here last year and you know uh, that was the best uh, the best blessings that we ever had from god i said why because my husband here he used to be a drunkard he used to beat me up and beat even the children up and he used to be violent at home but you know he has changed a lot now i i is already he has some parts in the church already i think being prepared to be an elder or i think he was an elder already so you see the changes that's what happened there's some uh, uh, miraculous change that happens in people's lives when they believe when they accept jesus to be their loving savior and god he uh jesus allowed himself to be addressed as god and accepted worship which belongs only to god See, in the Bible it says blasphemy. If somebody uh, calls himself a god, it's it's like a blasphemy to God. As we examine these credentials of Jesus, three further questions arise: What better credentials could He offer? If God were to come and dwell among men today, can you please turn off that? Uh, if God were to come and dwell among men today. Could he give more conclusive uh, proof of his deity? Is there any other personality in all history who has a better claim to deity than Jesus Christ? Is there one? I could not think of any. Jesus Christ here, as you can see in the photo, he had power over death. That's why when he promised that uh, I can resurrect you from death if you die, because everybody dies, then I, I believe it because he himself was able to uh, rise from the dead. The challenge of Jesus Christ, his challenge is logical. Jesus Christ's challenge is direct; it is winsome and personal. He said to each one of us, "You have heard my claims. You have examined my credentials. What are you going to do with this evidence? What are you going to do with me?" That is the biggest the question that is asking. Learning so much about Jesus Christ, what are you going to do about him? If Jesus was just an ordinary man, we could afford to treat him with indifference, with flippancy and contempt. But if he is God, this changes everything. He becomes our king. Indifference to him becomes treason, and we owe him the undivided worship of our hearts. That is the that is uh, what Jesus said. Or that is what we're supposed to be the uh, our attitude to Jesus, uh, giving us this kind of challenge. So we should love Jesus because he's the one, he's the only one of all of everyone in the universe and the whole universe. He's the only one who offers uh, salvation and eternal life to us. Of course, the devil also offers that. That's why the devil says, uh, "Don't worry. If you obey me, you will also live forever." live forever that's why the devil teaches that when you die you continue to live you report to god or you roam around in the form of a ghost and so on so that means you never died so he also offer everlasting death i mean everlasting life but are you going to believe that if you are if after you die you roam around like a ghost uh, flying around are you going to be happy you see your loved ones uh, being uh, taken advantage by uh, some people even by your friends you see your your uh, wife 
is being fooled by one of your friends and you cannot do anything about it, is that going to be a happy, happy situation for you? Happy condition for you? Or you go to heaven, what? Looking down here on earth and seeing your family suffer, suffer from this COVID-19 and everything, are you going to be happy? So it is very different from what Jesus teaches because Jesus teaches that heaven is a happy place. You will, uh, uh, it, it, you'll be happy forever. You will not uh, be able to think of problems anymore. That's why after we go to heaven, there will be what you call the last cry when we see uh, what is shown to us, our loved ones not coming, not going to heaven, then that will be our last cry. But after that, Jesus will erase from our memories all the things of the past. That's why we can only be happy forever. Because if we can keep on being reminded about our loved ones, our families, maybe your wife or your spouse or your children who were not saved because they did not want to listen to the instructions of Jesus, uh, instruction that come even from the parents, from Jesus, then of course they will not be there with us, but you cannot force them. You cannot force them. They, they have to make the decision themselves. But if that stays in your memory, if you're there ahead of everyone else and you're roaming around and you're seeing that happen, are you going to be happy? Heaven is not going to be a happy place. It's contradictory to what Jesus says. So Jesus says, come to me and I will give you life. What then shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? Our eternal destiny depends upon the answer we give to this question. Pilate, the Roman governor, wrestled with it in days of old, and it, changed, it challenges every man who comes free, uh, who comes face to face with Jesus Christ today. Only two courses are open to us. We can accept Jesus or we can reject him. We can crucify him afresh or we can crown him as the undisputed master of our lives. There is no middle ground. In Romans 10, 9, it says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised them from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Of course, it says here, if you confess Jesus, if you believe that he is alive, if you believe that he is our savior, you confess it to the other people. And when you confess it and believe also, uh, belief is also a, a, a thing that must show in our lives. If you say you believe in Jesus, even our action should also be according to the teachings of Jesus. Because if you say, I believe in Jesus, but then your actions are different from his command. Uh, for example, Jesus said, uh, you believe me? Yes, I believe you. Okay. Uh, tomorrow is going to be the Sabbath day, seven day, Saturday, Sabbath, and we're supposed to go to church. And Sabbath, he said, you, you're supposed to be in church. And, and you say, Lord, you know, my day is tomorrow or on Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, and so on. Then your belief is questionable. That's why, but if you believe with him sincerely and obey his will and t tell the world about it, according to the Bible, you will be saved. Now here, only Jesus can give solution to all the problems of the world. And we need his solution right now. For example, these problems going on right now, this COVID-19, uh, it makes us a lot of people wary. We are suffering anxiety and so on because everything that is happening nowadays is contrary to what Jesus taught. Jesus teaches in the Bible that we have, to fellow, have, we have to love one another. We have to get together. We have to fellowship with one another in love and to encourage each other. That's why our prayer should be for Jesus to come soon to intervene in this situation. So uh, if not, uh, maybe inter intervene in this situation right now. We should pray for that so that we can go back to fellowshipping with each other again and uh, worship him even in churches and we can all encourage each other to prepare for his coming. This is why people who believe in Jesus, especially his followers or his children, they are all looking forward to the coming of Jesus again, as he promised in the Bible. 
in order for Jesus to give them complete deliverance from all the sufferings in this world. So my question to you, my friends, are, are you also looking forward to Jesus coming? Are you also ready to meet him? That is the question that you have to try to answer yourself. Answer it sincerely. Now, I know, let me just review uh, things that I've, I've uh, mentioned about Jesus, which I also shared uh, some of them last week. For example, here is a former president of the United States. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, know about him. That's Abraham Lincoln. Let me ask you, supposing an authentic 1,000-year-old prophecy was found containing intimate details of the life of this famous American president, imagine the new reports of this discovery reading like this. The Smithsonian uh, Institution announces that an ancient scroll has been kept in remarkably good state of preservation. After the most rigorous scientific testing, Smithsonian archaeologists are, have agreed that the scroll is from the Viking period and contains an authentic prophecy of the life and labors of Abraham Lincoln. What do you think will happen? What a gasp of astonishment would echo around the world. Suppose details of Lincoln's birthplace, early years of poverty, inauguration, character, achievement, popularity, opposition, betrayal, ass assassination, etc., were all spelled out in the scroll with remarkable fidelity, even to the exact year, exact month, day, and hour of the president's death, and all the 1,000 years in advance. What do you think will happen? This news, of course, is fiction. But this one about Jesus, these are facts. This is a fact. The claims of Jesus Christ are supported by just such a series of predictions as we have uh, described. The Old Testament writings of, all, of them all uh, completed hundreds of years before Jesus' birth contain over 300 prophecies of Jesus Christ amounting to a remarkable detailed biography of the man of Nazareth written centuries in advance. See? A lot of predictions about Jesus Christ were written 150 years before he, he was born in Bethlehem. This cumulative prophetic witness has been called the assembly line of Old Testament prophecy. Like an automobile in the making built up piece by piece as it passes slowly through the production plant, the image of the promised deliverer or Messiah gradually takes shape and definition as the pages of the Old Testament are returned. Described by one prominent scholar as the overmastering phenomenon of Bible prophecy, this combined prophetic testimony provides Jesus Christ with unique credential. No other religious leader and no other personality in all the history of the world ever stepped out of such an incredible background. See, if you study the background of Jesus Christ, just remember uh, over 150 years ago with about 300 prophecies, 300 things said about him, about his coming, the coming Messiah. And they were all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Would you still doubt that he's the Messiah that is supposed to save us? From the hundreds of intriguing Old Testament prophecies which focus on Jesus Christ, we select the following significant examples. For example, there are many a spoken prophecy found in Genesis, for example, the promise, the seed of the woman who would bruise the serpent's head. That is also, that's a prophecy about Jesus. Another spoken prophecy, the coming of Shiloh, the peace bringer. That is a prophecy about Jesus. He came to this world to bring peace. He looked for the sinners to come down, down to uh, tell them to get away from sin so that they live in peace because sinners are not living in peace. In Numbers, he also there's a prophecy about the coming of the star of Jacob and it is about him. In Deuteronomy 18, 18 and 19, the coming of the prophet like unto Moses, that is about Jesus. In Micah 5, 2, a prophet who will be born in Bethlehem, identified as his birthplace, 
that was only fulfilling Jesus. And that was predicted about 100, 150 years before it happened. And there was probably no place yet named Bethlehem at that time, but it was already named. In Isaiah 7, uh, 14, he was born of a virgin to be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. And that is what happened to Jesus. Born in, uh, with an, a virgin, born of a virgin and was called Emmanuel. In Isaiah, is the Prince of Peace, the mighty God. Another the text in Isaiah, the preaching and healing ministry of Jesus Christ, of this coming Messiah. And, and it happened to Jesus. And also, because when that was written, it was just a, a prophecy. Jesus was not here yet. In Isaiah again, the sufferings and death of this Messiah, Jesus Christ. They were all already written before they happened. The birth of Jesus Christ and so on. Look at, just examine all these prophecies about the coming Messiah before they even came. Prophesied to come out of Bethlehem. Prophesied to be priced for 30 pieces of silver according to the Old Testament of Zechariah. God, the word who was made flesh, it was him. It was the word and the beginning was the word. The word was in God and the word was God. It was he himself who became flesh, the word in the beginning. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost to save people from their sin. We know that story. He was tempted by Satan. And, and according to Colossians 2, 8 and 9, he has the fullness of Godhead bodily, who man through vain philosophy will despise. Is that true? There are people, human beings, who are claiming to, to be the Messiah, to be the Son of God, uh, sent to this earth to save the people. But uh, but uh, they, I have not, I never read their, their names in the Bible. So what are they doing? They are, they are fake messiahs, fake messiahs. And they will pay for that kind of blasphemy that they're doing when, G when uh, Jesus comes. Because God said, of course, we are all children of God. I am a son of God. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. But God only has one begotten son. That is only Jesus Christ. If I adopt maybe 100 children, but I have one son and I have adopt another 99, all those 99 are gonna be my children. But my son, my only begotten son is only one. So we cannot uh, fake it by saying that we are the uh, real son of God, the Messiah uh, sent by God to save people on this earth because that is, that is deception and that is fake and that is blasphemy. And according to Hebrews, but many people will do that because it was already prophesied. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, is God's son whose throne is in heaven. This person might be saying that he's the son of God, but, and he, he could also say that I have a throne in heaven. That's true. Of course, he can also say that. But if you cannot verify anything in the Bible, uh, the Bible says uh, in Galatians 1.8, if an angel comes to you, and tell you something. Oh, uh, Noel, this is the son of God, this person here, your neighbor there. And then where in the Bible does it say that my neighbor is the son of God? If it doesn't say that, you have to drive that angel away. Tell him you're not an angel from God. You go away, you're an angel of Satan. And uh, you better, if you don't leave right now, I'm gonna call Jesus to kick you out. Hebrews, God uh, and, and John, uh, 1 John 5, 5, He's a true God, according to Romans. True God, that means he's not a fake God. Acts 4, 7 to 12. There is no salvation without Jesus Christ. Even during the time of Enoch, seventh generation from Adam, he, Enoch already prophesied about this coming Messiah, about Jesus Christ, who's going to come uh, to return with the righteous people to be with him for eternity. He's going to come with, uh, together with thousands of his saints. Compare all the prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament and see if they were fulfilled. In the Old Testament, it says that he will be born in Bethlehem. In the New Testament, where was he born? In Bethlehem. In the Old Testament, born of a virgin, according to Isaiah. In the New Testament, he was born of a virgin. He will become from the line of David. New Testament, he came from the line of David. He will be murdered by Herod. Uh, uh, attempted to be murdered by Herod. In the New Testament, it was happened. It happened. He will be betrayed by a friend 
it was his friend who tried to betray him in the New Testament. He will be sold for 30 pieces of silver. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, crucified to be crucified, New Testament. So all of this, uh, lots will be cast for his clothes. According to Psalms, the Old Testament, in Matthew, his clothes, uh, there were lots cast for his clothes. And even today, part of his clothes were still being sold. But I didn't believe that it's part of the clothes of Jesus. We were in Mexico one time in a church, and they were selling a piece of cloth like that. And they said, this, this is uh, part of the cloth of Jesus. Wow, I said, how can they, how can still, how can this, first of all, how did they treat here in Mexico? And how can it be a part? And yet many people, probably they do not read about Jesus, they do not read the Bible. Many people bought it. And they were so happy that they had a part of the clothes of Jesus, or even the shroud of Jesus. Because uh, he crucified, according to the Old Testament and New Testament, he was crucified. Large cost, okay. He will be buried in a rich man's tomb. That happened also. Uh, the year, date, and hour of his death, it was also mentioned in the Bible, and raised in the third day. See, how can you doubt who else was able, uh, had been predicted with so many different, about uh, 300 different predictions and prophecies and all fulfilled uh, in the person. And even, you can even trace the genealogy of Jesus. You can see at the end there, Jesus. You can, uh, you can verify from Mary, the parents of Mary, the parents all the way. It goes back to David, goes back to Abraham and then to Adam. And Adam came from God to Noah and so on. And of course, uh, and if, even if Jesus did not really become the real father of uh, Jesus, I mean, Joseph, still you can also trace him because he was the assigned father of Jesus. You can also trace him all the way back to Adam and to God. There are also, there were also acted prophecies in the Bible, acted prophecies. For example, the mystic Jacob's ladder, the Passover lamb, the brazen serpent, the smitten rock, and in Leviticus, the whole sacrificial service of the ancient Hebrew sanctuary, uh, which dramatized the prophecy of uh, Christ's uh, sacrificial death. Here, uh, a photo of the uh, mystic ladder. This is a dream of Joseph, Joseph, a dream of Jacob, I'm sorry, Jacob's ladder. So they were all, all these prophecies were pointing to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ, uh, connecting us to heaven. And also the Passover, uh, those who sprinkled blood on the doors were spared from the angel of death during the 10 plagues in, his, in Egypt. That is pointing to Jesus Christ also, because uh, in order to be washed from our sins, we need to be washed by the blood of Jesus that will spare us from eternal death. Christ, our Passover lamb. The Exodus is the story of Israel's salvation. The Exodus is also a foreshadow of the salvation of God offers to everyone who trusts in Christ. The Passover was a time of remembrance as well as a time of celebration of deliverance. The Passover points to Jesus Christ. And here, the brazen serpent, uh, it's symbolized by the brazen serpent. Those who look at the serpent, they were saved from dying. When remember the story of uh, the Israelites, when they were all complaining and complaining, and uh, God sent uh, a lot of serpents, and uh, uh, those who look at the serpent, they were spared, but those who did not, they all died. And then this uh, meat and rock, and rock represented Jesus here. It's the source of water, and uh, Jesus said, if you drink my water, you will never thirst. Of course, yeah. Uh, and also here, the uh, sacrificial sanctuary that was also built by the Israelites during the time, their time. Anyway, there were also, beside those prophet, prophetic prophecies, there were also people prophecy. The life and stories of several Old Testament characters contain so many points of resemblance between this man and the Redeemer that we cannot but regard them as typical characterist characters, prophetic anticipations, who uh, for, 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 for foreshadowed Christ 
in various aspects of his messianic character and work. Each of these Old Testament prof, uh, person, uh, personages is like a living prophetic finger post pointing forward to a larger, richer, and future personality. What are these uh, people prophecy? For example, Melchizedek, the function of a king and priest, the, uh, or the people prophecy about Joseph, you know, the, uh, so uh, Jesus Christ is our king and also our priest here, who represent, uh, the, who represent us uh, to God the Father. And also Joseph, the parallel between Joseph and Jesus Christ are almost breathtaking. You know, Joseph, he was abandoned by his own people, by his own brothers, sold and so on. But in spite of what they did to him, uh, Joseph, uh, when he was in Egypt, he became the governor of Egypt. And what did he do? For all the bad things, he was despised, re rejected and betrayed by his own brothers, by his own people, finally sold to uh, paltry, paltry sum. Uh, he was sold to be slave and so on. But of course, he became a governor of Egypt and eventually with all those bad things that were done to him, how did he pay them back? He did not uh, reward them with uh, revenge, but he took care of them during the famine. He took all those people who treated him badly. He took them back and helped them during the time of famine. The story of Moses, for example, condemned to death uh, in, uh, uh, in infancy, yet miraculously spared, becomes God's instrument of deliverance from Egyptian bondage. That also point to Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ, uh, at the young age, he was attempted to be murdered by Herod, but he was also spared by the angels. And what the purpose of Jesus was to deliver his people. He is going to deliver us from um, this uh, sinful world. And Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, and also Jonah, sacrificed for the salvation of the sheep's crew. So all of these people prophecy, review them. Here is Abraham about to sacrifice his son, uh, his beloved son, Isaac. And God himself sacrificed his son, Jesus and allowed him to die. But here in this case, uh, God did not allow Isaac to die. And here, the Melchizedek, the function of king and priest. That is the function of Jesus. He is also our king and also our priest. And Joseph and his brother, story Joseph, who was sold, who was rejected, uh, abandoned by his brothers, but in the end he helped his brothers, his family, when there was a famine and suffering in Egypt in their place. He took them to Egypt so they can help them. Moses and the children of Israel, see? Moses, who was attempted to be uh, murdered at a young age, at a as a baby, God spared him in order to deliver his people. God has also spared Jesus. He allowed him to die because the, the penalty of sin is death, so God, has to show that he was willing to die. He sacrificed his life because he was human. When he came, he uh, was word became flesh, he became human like us. So he died, but then God redeemed him by resurrecting him to be a God and he will be our deliverer, our savior when he comes. And uh, Boaz, the kinsman, redeemer, and also Jonah sacrificed for the salvation of the ship's crew. Remember the story of Jonah? He tried to hide from God. He tried to run away from the assignment that God gave him. But when God has an assignment for you, you better attend to it. So because uh, God, God's plan has to be uh, done. It has to be uh, continued, has to be fulfilled. Time prophecies also. The promised Messiah here called Shiloh, meaning peace bringer, would come before the scepter of rulership as finality was finally snatched forever from the tribe of Judah. History shows that when Jesus was about 12 years old, uh, Archelaus, the king of Judea, was removed by the Roman power and replaced by Cor Cor Coponius. 
the prosecutor, uh, the procurator. Thus, the kingdom of Judah, the last vestige of greatness of Israel, was reduced to the status of mere province of Syria. But Christ had been born in Bethlehem. Shiloh had come while Judah still held the scepter, and thus the prophecy met its exact fulfillment. So all the prophecies written in the Bible, they all met their exact fulfillment. Because God said, uh, the word that comes out of my mouth, it shall come, not come back to me void. And that was uh, that's, uh, an image of Jesus uh, talking with the elders and leaders of the church uh, at a young age. He was there uh, telling them or showing to them, explaining to them that he is on his father's mission. The Messiah here called the messenger of covenant would come while the temple in Jerusalem still stood in the grandeur. Christ fulfilled this prediction also, but 40 years after his death, the Roman soldiers under, the, under Titus destroyed the magnificent temple and leaving one stone upon another, not leaving one stone upon another. So here's an image when the Roman soldiers went to destroy. Remember when they were all celebrating one time, all the people were happy, but Jesus was crying. He was sad when they asked him why he was sad, because he said, you're celebrating this, but let me tell you that uh, time will come when soldiers will come and destroy this temple. And when this temple is destroyed, there you will not see even one stone on top of another. And according to the writer Josephus, he said, when that happened, you will see that the whole place was really flattened. Not one stone was uh, sitting on top of another stone. So David 9, 24, 27, the most amazing and explicit of all time prophecies of the Old Testament is that of the 70 prophetic weeks symbolizing 490 literal years which were to reach from the Persian restoration of the Jewish nation to the appearance of the death of the Messiah, the Prince. When this prophecy and annual Passover ritual are studied together, it will be seen that the precise year month, day, and hour of Christ's death were signified beforehand, hundreds of years in advance. The 70 weeks prediction is the keystone of the arc of the messianic prophecy. Christ himself used this amazing prediction as the launching pad for this public ministry on earth, for his public. That's why you who are studying there about Jesus and so on, call an um, Adventist pastor to explain to you this prophecy, because in this prophecy, your hair will grow, your hair will stand up, I'm sorry, to see that exactly uh, as prophesied, the timing when Jesus Christ will uh, be killed and when he will raise up, the day, the hour, it was all fulfilled according to this prophecy here. Dr. Stoner, former chairman of the Department of Mathematics in uh, Pasadena, California, working with about 600 students for several years, they applied the principle of probability to the prophecy of Jesus. There are about 150 prophecies that they read about Jesus, 125 prophecies. But they said, maybe I will just choose eight. They just choose eight of those 125 prophecies to see if those eight will happen to all of them will happen in one month. And you know, according to a long time of study, after their study for a long time, they came up to the conclusion that the chances or probability or possibility of it happening in one month, even just eight of the prophecies about Jesus Christ will be 3, 6, 9, 12, 14, about 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 times 3, that uh, about 33 zeros. Yeah, about 33 zeros. With one, I don't even know what figure is that. I cannot, it, that is the possibility. So in other words, it's telling me that the possibility is zero. There's no possible, possible way that even just eight of the 125 prophecies about Jesus 
will all be fulfilled in one month. So in conclusion, my friends, imagine that a house with 300 doors and 300 locks, a house has 300 doors and 300 locks. The locks are so novel and so complicated that there is not a single uh, locksmith in the country who can make a key to fit any one of those doors. Then imagine that a man who arrived from the scene with a master, arrived from the scene, came with a master key and it fit all the baffling locks and it opened all the 300 doors. Now, could you doubt that his, that his was indeed a master key? Could you doubt it? As we have seen in the Old Testament prophecies, like a series of baffling locks, waiting for the arrival of a man with a master key. One man and only one in all the history uh, fits this uncanny prediction. And that man is Jesus. So with 300 doors, couldn't be opened by anyone. And one man arrived and he's able to open all those doors. Would you doubt? that that person holds the master key. So my friends, let me ask you, would you doubt that Jesus Christ has the master key to our salvation? Jesus Christ has the master key to give us deliverance from all the suffering that we have in this world, as he has promised. He has the master key and power to be able to heal us if we are sick. And he still has the master key to resurrect us from death and to give us eternal life. So my challenge to you, Brian, my friends here, some of the Old Testament prophecies are sharply focused and explicit, almost to the point of hairline precision. Some are less focused, more like hints or pointers. Some are even cryptic. Some standing alone can be argued about. It is their combined testimony that is so irresistible. Like the spokes of a wheel, they all, co uh, they all converge in one historical figure and the cumulative weight of evidence that they bring to, to bear in support of his claim is simply overwhelming. To him give all the prophets witness and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. We have found Jesus, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, that's found in John 1, 45. So my question to you, my friends, is do you believe in Jesus now? With all the facts, that you have heard, that you can verify the history about Jesus for the last three or uh, well, last three to five, about I think four or five Sabbaths, I've been talking about Jesus Christ. I've been talking about the validity of the Bible and what the Bible says about Jesus. You know, the Bible, uh, even during the war, First World War, Second World War, it was a miracle why this Bible was not destroyed why all the bombings happened there in Europe, in the Middle East and so on, all kinds of wars. And yet this world preserved. And we have seen it in the museum in Jerusalem, the, even the, uh, the old uh, writings of the Bible, when they were transferred from stones to, I don't know, maybe different era to the uh, skins of animals probably, we didn't know the process of and then eventually to the old type of paper, but they still have their old uh, remains of the original writings of the Bible found in the caves near the Dead Sea. And we have seen it, I've seen it with my own two eyes. And it was translated, it was transferred to see to the modern writings now, and there's Bible all over the world. They all talk about this Messiah. 300 predictions and prophecies about the Messiah and they were all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Would you still doubt him? Would you still doubt that he is the Messiah, the savior of mankind? 
Would you still doubt his promises that he can save us? He can resurrect us from death and give us eternal life. So my challenge to you, my friend, this uh, morning is if you already believe that Jesus is really the Messiah and he's not just an ordinary man, uh, man and he is a God who is able to save us from the curse and uh, the curse of sin and punishment of sin through death, through eternal death. If you believe that he is the only one who can save us, my challenge to you is that would you give your heart to him today? Would you? We're now gonna finish the, our, uh, the message that uh, was given to me to be preached to you. So we're now gonna listen to our closing song. Let's listen to the closing song here. Betty. Are we going to transfer it? No. It's a command. Thank you so much, my friends, for being with us again today. I hope that uh, uh, we all have been refreshed with the uh, knowledge about the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I would like now to invite you 
to bow our heads as we close this program with a prayer. Father God, thank you so much uh, for reminding us about you. I love to tell a story about you, dear Father. Thank you so much that you have uh, inspired me to do this research, to learn a lot of things about you because it make, made uh, my faith so strong uh, on you. But I'd, I'd like the Father that this faith that you have built in my mind and in my heart will not only be in me, but as I share it to other people that they will also dis- develop a strong and a faith on you. Faith like a rock that it could not be moved. Even stronger than rock could not be broken. Well, Father, uh, we are, uh, thank you so much again for bringing us to another week, closer to your coming. But we are feeling so weary, dear Father. Uh, we are already, uh, we seem, it seems that this world, this earth where we are, is not a very happy world to live in anymore because of anxiety, because, for example, this COVID-19. It does not, uh, we are not allowed even to get together anymore. We are locked down in our houses. And some people, many people are dying, uh, getting sick and dying. Their father is not a very happy place anymore. And everything that we are being taught to do, it's contradictory to what you have taught us in the Bible. Because we are, we're supposed to appreciate nature. We're supposed to breathe fresh air, but here, because of this COVID-19, we have to cover our noses and not be able to breathe the proper oxygen that we're supposed to be breathing. And we're supposed, you said that we're supposed to have fellowship with one another, but how can we have fellowship now? They have been restricted now to only about 10 in each house to be able to have a group meeting and so on. Dear Father, if this is according to your will, then fine, so it be. But if it's not according to your will, we ask you that please intervene and stop this, uh, this uh, uh, sacrifice that we are having because of this COVID-19. Please stop and give healing to all those people who are uh, being affected by it, especially your children and their father. Let us go back to, your, uh, uh, to being able to uh, fellowship with each other again, to have um, uh, enjoy with each other's company and to be able to encourage it to be, and be able to encourage each other as we prepare for your coming. But we leave it to you, dear Father. This is just our pleadings. And dear Father, but please help us that our faith will be strong so that we will always be ready so that when you come in the clouds of heaven, us, together with our loved ones and all those people who are listening, will be among those people who, will, who you are going to save in your eternal kingdom. We are now going to separate from each other from this program. I pray that you give us now the blessing that you have in store for us today and help us to be able to keep this Sabbath holy and help us to focus our mind to you because this day is a reminder of your creation, of uh, the birthday of your creation. On the seventh day, you kept it holy and you rested and you're uh, concentrated. We would like to meditate on you. We ask all this favor in Jesus' whole name, I pray. Amen.